missing the speaker. Oh, thank you very much. Better than the Wi Fi? If it works, I guess. Um, okay, yeah. because I think the people in the back should be able to hear me, which is fine. Um, I hope all of you have prepared at least AVM or something similar, um, which was the request in the uh, presentation. Bits. If not, um, you can watch how others do it or uh, see what I show on the screen. Um, so, I work on Gluster. I'm one of the uh, core maintainers um, working on many different parts in Gluster. And I'll show you a bit uh, about what we're going to do today. So, well, the agenda is not really complete, but um, I'll give an introduction about what Gluster is a bit, um, so that everyone understands how Gluster works. From there on, I'll show you a bit um, how to actually set it up so that you can actually 
use it in your VMs. We'll show a bit about the technical parts there as well. Because the network is not the fastest, we'll do it in bits and pieces. So um, while things are installing and you might be waiting for the packages to download, it's not very big, it's, it's only 12 megabytes or something, um, depending on what dependencies you already have. Um, I'll explain a bit more about upcoming features and the recent additions that we did in the last year's release. So um, any questions <coughs> that pop up, just let me know and I'll, I'll answer those. So cluster itself, who's familiar with, with cluster? Okay, uh, a few. Um, who has actually used cluster before and not only read about it? Okay. <laughs> um, so cluster basically provides you with a network file system. That's the whole purpose. So you provide the file system and you can store um, any normal POSIX complaint files on there, whatever you, you like to do. So people use it for um, object storage or archival or um, well, media streaming is, is one of the things that Cluster does also very well. Uh, storing backups is, is something that's, that a lot of people have interest, so you write it once, possibly for many clients. And, um, well, backups hopefully are, are mostly stale. Um, but when needed, you can, you can recover them again. We provide access protocols through a fuse mount, so we can mount it over a fuse kernel uh, file system. It starts a process in the background, and its process runs in user space and actually does all the work for you. We do um, Swift on file, which ties in with cluster, and Swift on file, on the other hand, ties in with OpenStack, so we can have your OpenStack Swift run on the cluster backend. Other components include uh, libgf API. libgf API is a user space library, and you can use this library in any of your applications. Kemu is one of the applications that uses libgf API and um, therefore speaks the cluster protocol natively. It can immediately use the files stored on a cluster volume without the need to go through a Linux file system mount on the client side and everything, so it's much more efficient. Um, everything. We don't use any metadata server at the moment. Um, it's completely distributed, and um, there's no metadata server that would cause a bottleneck in this sense. So metadata servers are normally pretty unique in your environment, and either have a bandwidth limitation or um, if you have only one, it's a single point of failure, and it might be that um, failover isn't easy enough or, or fast enough. So we don't use any metadata server for this. Um, if a server goes down, the client knows the logic. The clients actually do all the, all the work and automatically can fail over. This makes it possible to um, scale out really, really well. The basics of Cluster, Cluster uses bricks. Bricks is the more or less like the, the storage unit or the storage um, backend that Cluster provides. A brick basically <coughs> is a directory or a storage server with a mount file system. So we use LVM, or we suggest to use LVM and LVM thin provisioning be below this file system so that we can do nice snapshots, but um, it basically is just a mounted file system anywhere. The file system needs to support extended attributes, so we don't support bricks on NFS, for example, because NFS doesn't do extended attributes yet. The bricks are the lowest level that cluster has. On top of the bricks, um, the file system of, of the bricks gets used by the cluster processes. The cluster processes are a stack of translators. A translator implements a particular functionality. So we have one translator called the POSIX translator, which speaks actual um, <coughs> POSIX semantics, like an open, a close, a read, and a write. All the other translators build on top of this POSIX translator, uh, and so on. 
Return status are very flexible. We've got a contribution that uses, instead of the POSIX translator, it doesn't speak a file system below it, it speaks LVM below it. So instead of creating a file, this particular translator creates a logical volume. So if you have a high virtualization workload, you could use this translator instead of the POSIX translator, and suddenly all your images that you create are actually logical volumes in the backend instead of files in the file system. All the translators are very flexible like this. You can mostly enable them, disable them at will. And um, yeah, anything that you implement in Gluster is basically a translator. All of these translators together combined over multiple servers. So you have multiple servers. All of them have a stack of translators. These servers together, these bricks together, they combine one volume. So a volume consists out of multiple bricks. Those bricks can be located on a single server. That's mostly not what you want if you want to distribute your environment. So you have multiple servers, and um, a volume combines all these bricks, all these servers into one, and makes um, a user-facing volume, a user-facing file system that spans all of these bricks. In Gluster, we call um, the servers peers. Because if you say to a cluster developer, my server doesn't work, it's not clear if this is a storage server or if this is a client actually using the services that a cluster environment provides. It can well be a web server that actually hosts websites on a cluster environment, but if you say my server doesn't work, it's, it's extremely unclear. So cluster has um, the notion of peers and any of the storage server um, our peers. We don't like to say cluster cluster a lot. It's it's a really awkward um, to pronounce. We call them trusted storage pools, which is basically a cluster of cluster servers. Who's not familiar with scale out and scale up, um, or well? We try to explain this in, in this diagram. Um, we have the scale up here on the vertical line. Scale up basically means you have a very powerful server. You start with maybe two disks in this in the server, it might have a tray of six disks. You start with two disks, you want to scale up, you add more disks every time you add more disks to this particular server. That's the scale up process. If you want to do scale out, um, you want to have more distribution, you want to have um, more servers. Gluster mostly is facilitating this scale-out way. So if you run out of storage, what you do is you add more servers. You add relatively cheap servers compared to this one very powerful scale-up server. Scale-up servers probably have multiple CPUs. You might, not stock, you might not have every socket filled with the CPU. If you need more power, you add more CPUs to this particular high-performing server. Um, which is extremely expensive, and it's a single point of failure. And it introduces limitations to other things. So, for example, bandwidth to one server is mostly, well, it's, it's definitely limited at some point. Um, you can scale up your bandwidth by adding more PCI cards and more network cards and everything. Um, this doesn't always work very well. Um, what you want is... Um, most likely, not only the scale-up process, but you want to scale-out. Scale-out is, in general, cheaper to add more hardware. Um, it, adds the, um, it adds to the performance, so more clients can actually distribute over all your network links because you have more servers. The distribution of your clients, assume that you have several hundred clients, maybe thousands of clients, ten thousand of clients. Um, all of these clients, if they hit a particular number of server, um, your resources get limited. If you add more servers, all of these clients suddenly distribute themselves over all of those servers. So um, you effectively have more bandwidth, and you have more storage. If a server dies, it's not such a big deal because the server only contains a small data set compared to a huge data set on extremely big servers. So it improves your recovery times and everything. Yeah. 
Yes. Yes. So the question is, um, can I scale out um, if I have a number of servers? Can I scale out the, a particular volume um, from two servers to twenty servers? Yes. So you can add if you have your volume. You start with two servers, and you notice well um, my drop box like facility is really popular, and everyone starts to use it. Everyone wants to upload files to this volume. What you can do is you can add um, another 18 servers to this volume. It, um, the clients automatically notice, so the, the cluster clients notice, and um, they will be able to use those whole 20 servers for storing files um, through this particular volume. You don't have to add additional volumes. You could create multiple volumes for different purposes if you want to, but you can have one volume and add additional servers um, two at a time, three at a time, or depending on your environment. Yes, but the, the client uh, knows about the original servers. There is backup servers that you can use in the master server, right? Yes. And it doesn't know about the, the new servers. Um, or it will learn about them from the cluster of the server. So, so, um, yeah, so I'll, I'll explain what you would do. So, when a cluster client connects to a cluster volume, it uses a host name to connect to a server, to a server. So in this case, we have three servers. Right? If your cluster client needs to mount this volume, um, and let's say there's a volume on top, um, it, for example, says, OK, I want to mount from this particular host name. If you add the other two servers, the client doesn't know about this host name, not for mounting. It knows, when it mounts, the whole volume layout. So upon mounting, the first request is, how does this volume look like? What servers do we have and which bricks do we have? So the client knows immediately um, how the volume looks like and which servers participate in the volume. <coughs> so the only thing where you need, or you manually would like to specify multiple server names would be at the time of mounting. So you can do that, you can pass multiple servers if the first server isn't available. You can pass options to have a backup volume entry point access server. Um, and it would just go through the whole list of servers and figure out, okay, which server is the first that's available. From this server that's available, it catches the whole volume layout. After that, the client knows all of the other servers and it can access those servers directly. So, so it knows the balance uh, between those servers, or only use the one point to do No. Yeah, I'll, I'll come ba back to that a bit later when I okay. explain the distribution. Mm -hmm. So, um, on the point of a, a single point of failure, because that's what you want to prevent while mounting. So, in case of mounting, this particular server number one is down, but these two are still up. Um, if you don't specify multiple servers, your mount will fail because it says, well, this server is not reachable or um, the, there's no daemon running, so you can't connect to the port. So you get an error message and it will fail. You can pass multiple servers on this mount command line and um, it will then iterate through those servers. You can also use um, DNS. DNS and provide multiple IP addresses for this particular entry point. So most of the times you don't really care well, the clients shouldn't care which server they mount from. And if you use DNS, it also gets a whole list of all the servers that are available for mounting. Um, and it would just iterate through all those IP addresses. It's okay, one after the other, and um, use it like that. So if you are scaling out, um, adding servers, your mount, um, it, it makes most sense to put new servers in a DNS entry and make sure that um, your cluster environment is reachable over, always over one single host name. And this DNS entry resolves to multiple IP addresses. When you add more servers, you add more IP addresses to this DNS entry and the clients will know on mounting which servers can be used and it will try each of them. Does it help? Yeah? 
Okay, so yeah, that's basically scale out. This is a really a scale out file system. Um, we can do scale up as well, but um, there are very few people that actually want to use cluster in a scale up fashion. Okay, so um, distribution of files. Um, files are basically randomly distributed, at least for people that see this, this, this distribution on the backend. And cluster stores files just in the file system, so you have the same directory structure and the file names on the backend as that you see um, through a mount point. Um, this distribution is basically random. It, it is based on the hashing algorithm and each particular brick that you see here. So we have two servers, we have two, both servers have one brick. And um, we use the file name for hashing. So um, we calculate the hash from the file name. This hash always falls into a range. Right? So we have a hashing function. If you say, okay, um, the hashing function um, always is somewhere between uh, 0 and 16. The result of this hash function is also between 0 or 16. What we do is we assign each brick a hash range. So 0 to 8 is on the first server, and 8 to 16 is on the second server. The client, because it's a file system, tend to use file names to access contents. So any file system without file names is basically not a file system. Um, so clients tend to know the files, file names. The client hashes this file name. The result of this hash is either 0 to 8 or somewhere between 8 to 16. And depending on that, the client connects to server 1 or server 2. So this is the whole distribution logic. The hash ranges are a bit bigger and we have a little twist in it. But um, this is basically how we distribute files. Yep. Does that mean that um, a simple rename could actually become a pretty expensive copy operation? Yes. Yeah. Okay. And so they can be? Not atomic, right? The rename should be atomic. You, people ex expect that. Um, <laughs> so it's not expensive. Um, a rename actually changes the name. Yes. Okay. So, but we have something called as point effects. Yes. We just point to the other server. Okay. Yeah. So, so Venki is one of the cluster developers. Um, so, if you have yeah. additional questions, you can you can ask me. So, um, the question was: if renames are really expensive because you change the name of the file. You hash the file name, so if you if the hash falls in the different break, it's a really expensive operation. You would need to move the file and everything. That's not what we do. We use a trick. We have something similar like hard links, but they are brick wide or volume wide kind of hard link like functionality. So what we do is um, we create this new name. Um, we don't have the actual file name anymore, but we place a hard link on the brick. It should have a file. Um, so that makes it much, much faster. Yeah. yeah, because otherwise you would have to be careful with that. Yes, yes, exactly. So that's not, not very easy. Yeah, um, okay, any other questions about how distribution logic works? So the distribution is all done on the client side, right? So the client, when mounting gets the volume layout, the client calculates the file name hash, and then the client connects to the particular servers. It's not server side. Distribution, it is all done client side. The client contains the logic. Yeah? Again, about, about the rename. What about the rename of the directory? Um, directories are located on all of the uh, bricks. So directories are not files, and we use the um, layout of directories um, over all the bricks. So if you create a directory, well, even the directory has a file name. But we create a directory on all of these bricks in this case. Directories are not uh, distributed? No, because we only do a distribution of contents, not, directly of, not the directories. Or, um, so only the leaves in a file system, like files, like um, device nodes, they get distributed. Um, directories are created on all of the bricks and they actually contain the hash ranges. So if you create a directory tree, the hash ranges 
are per directory in the end. Um, if you create a file in this directory, and one distribution part is empty, and um, whenever the file gets located, the directory contains the file. <laughs> So, is there any uh, directly atomic when you distribute it? Maybe you have you know, 27, so you have 20 copies of the same directory, right? What, what some are empty except, except um, some of them are empty, depending on how the file is uh, distributed. Yes, so it's, it's not completely atomic. Um, we have some issues with, with multi concurrent directory creation. Um, so, if um, multiple clients run a whole directory tree creation at the same time. There is currently no complete locking for that. I th well, I, I think um, one of the guys posted patches uh, this week who's, who's actually fixing this. Um, but that, that's something that has been a pain point for us because um, if one client creates the whole directory structure and another client creates the same directory structure, at exactly at the same time, they might create, one client creates the directory first in this part and the other client creates the directory first in that part, and they assign different kind of metadata to the directory, then it gives a conflict and gives a bit of trouble. But this is an extremely <laughs> rare yeah. occasion, so, um, so you really have to try very hard to get that to fail. Yeah. But I'm about the common scenario, for example, of it, when you want to delete uh, a directory, you will name it, mm -hmm. which is fast and atomic. You, you expect it, that it's uh, atomic and fast, and then you delete it later. Mm -hmm. So we, we accept, expect this uh, operation to be very fast and reliable. Uh, not that, yes, it's deleted so, there, but not on... Yes, so the um, at the moment it's not atomic. Atomic doesn't mean that it's fast, right? Atomic just means that it's safe to do. So there, there's a difference in there. but. Um, yes, we're, we're working hard to get that fixed. We want to address this, um, and we also want to backport those fixes to, to our stable releases. Um, but yeah, so at the moment it's not atomic, but it's really difficult to hit this in a real-world example. You actively have to run loops of the creating directory structures and try really hard to, to reproduce it, so it's, it's not trivial to hit this problem. So, you had questions? Yeah, yeah. What about big files? Where big files are there split between bricks? No, we no, have that sorry. option to do so, and I'll come back to that later. Okay. <laughs> 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 yeah, uh, I have a question. Maybe you get that also. Yeah, sure. there, uh, can I enforce somehow to be uh, for a file to be at specific brick? And uh, if I'm doing this uh, just a joint uh, file system, uh, can I just uh, if I lose one, can I still mount at least the files that are still there? Without uh, so, so yes, so files underneath? Um, yes, so, so the splitting up files, we come back to that whole topic later. So, um, but yes, at the moment, if you, so if you just use the standard distribution logic, you see the files that were created on server one, you see them on the backend file system, the files that were created on Server number two, you see them on their backend back faster. So, if you want, you can back them up. And if your whole cluster infrastructure, you don't have any network or whatever, um, is down, then you still can access your files yeah, there directly. If you split them in pieces, um, that's well, more difficult because. Yeah. If, if I don't have uh, big files and just one big <coughs> files, do I lose just some files or whole cluster module will disappear and break up? And um, in this case, well, that's actually the next step. So, um, in this case, this case is replicated. Um, if you lose one server, then that's okay. You still have the copy of the file. In um, the distribution volume, if you lose server one, these two files will just not be available. Yeah, but uh, the rest piece. So, file number three will be there, but these two files won't. Um, can I force some file to be on some specific brick? If you really want to, you can. That's not how cloud computing and distribution normally tends to work. But yeah, if you really absolutely want to do that, you could. Yes. Okay. Uh, uh, it means that when I add a new brick to the cluster, mm -hmm. uh, the whole directory structure 
immediately cloned to the brick. Exactly. So you, um, yeah, we, we call it rebalancing the environment. So the, um, or just fixing the layout of the directory structure. So um, creating the directory structure is important because each directory has those hash ranges. Um, yes, if you create, an, if you add a new brick, the whole directory tree needs to get created, and the hash range needs to get updated to have the <coughs> evenly distribution. Otherwise, if you add a new server or a new brick, um, this will not effectively be used yet. Yeah. So that's that's a relatively expensive thing to do. That's something that we're at, that Fenki is addressing with DHT v2. So distribution hashing translator version two. Um, we want to. Um, improve these kind of operations um, and make it much, much faster. So, uh, if I add a brick, there is some uh, kind of operation to actually rehash that and yes. redistribute? Yes. And if I want to remove brick, I can tell it and rehash that back? Uh, or uh, yes, so, so what you do is you say, I want to remove this brick, no new files will get created there, and the old files need to get moved off there. You probably want to do this operation because even though we use relatively small servers, these relatively small servers um, tend to have like 30, 40 disks, right? So that's a lot of data. And if you want to remove the contents of these uh, disks to other servers, um, that takes a lot of network bandwidth. So most of the times people only do these kind of operations, like the rebalancing and everything, in some kind of a maintenance window, or at least the period of the day where um, users don't get influenced too much with, with much network traffic. Oh, well, yes, it's, it's possible, yeah. Do you want to ask something? Or? No. OK. So the replication. Um, so I mentioned that we have translators, right? So the distribution layer is a translator. The replication is just another translator. They just do different things. One says, you need to store your file there. And the other one says, well, you need to store your files on both places. In this case, this is a very simple um, logic. Uh, we have two servers. We want to have two copies of the data. And um, yeah, you have two bricks. So the client says, OK, this volume layout um, contains the replication. These two bricks should be copies of each other. So whenever I need to do a write of a file, I'm going to write it twice. So the active bandwidth, or the, the bandwidth that you actually have for writing um, becomes only half of your bandwidth that you have physically available, because your writes have to actually go from the client to the server to both the bricks. It's client side. For reading, so, this is... Yeah. So the client has to send the file to the both servers? Yeah. Exactly, exactly. So, um, so for writing, the client actively sends the, the data to both sides because um, all, our, or all these features are client-side. The distribution was done client-side, the application is done client-side as well. For reading, this is not the case. Um, for reading, we accept the data of the brick that first uh, responded to the initial uh, lookup call. So you do a lookup when you open a file. Um, so if you open a file, the first brick that actually responded um, is used to read the data from. <coughs> yeah. What about the different versions of data on, on different bricks? Is it possible? Sorry? Different versions of the data on different bricks. So the question is, is it possible to have different data or different versions of the data on different bricks? And that's only possible if you would run into a split brain scenario where one client updates a part of a brick. So for example, server 2 is not available for a time. Um, so it contains all data. Another server or one, one of the clients updates a file. This update is only on server 1. Server 2 comes back up online. So it would have old data. So it's some kind of a, um, not really split brain, because we know that this one was up at the time being. Um, we know that this one has an older version. And when we do a lookup, when we do this open of a file, we do actually check 
if the files are in sync. So we, can, we have some uh, change log um, for the replication mechanism. It says, okay, you missed so many operations, and um, then we can desync the data. So we know that this data is valid, this data is old, and it needs to be repaired. If for the other way, we have another client on this side, and we would really have a split brain, so the network between these two would die uh, for whatever reason, this client would be able to update file number one on this server, and this client would be able to update file number one on this server. That can be problematic because they don't need to write the same data to the file. Maybe if you have a sparse file, um, the file was created on both bricks, one client on the left updates the beginning of the file, the other client on the right updates the end of the file. Gluster cannot decide for you which contents to keep, um, and Gluster ex will um, prevent access to the file after that when it detects this kind of um, misbehavior. So um, there are different ways to solve this, um, including adding a, a third copy or um, making sure that only one server always has the main, or is, is seen as the main node. Um, so if server two dies, um, you can still write to server one. Um, but if server two notices that there's no connection to server one anymore, or oh, yes, let's say the network splits, server so one is the main source, um, server so two is still up and running, but it cannot connect to server one, and we can say, well, server so two doesn't accept any rights. Uh, we, can, we can do other things with quorum and, and things, so you can prevent these kind of things from happening. Um, split brains are um, yeah, most annoying to have, so um, we, we need to figure out ways um, how to prevent them, how to repair them automatically, and those things are all available. We can we can do many different kind of solutions for that. Do you have uh, auto quorum enforcement? Are there some <coughs> smart algorithm detecting this guy Rick mm -hmm. number two disappeared for such and such amount of time, and now I'm going to enforce a new replica. So we do this enforcing. Um, to not accept anything from server 2 or clients get informed that server 2 is not there, but we don't do auto-migration of data, we don't do automatic creation of uh, replicas. Um, <coughs> that is something we would like to have, but it's very difficult to um, get some procedure that is usable by everyone. So we have a lot of users that have already built their own puppet scripts and uh, monitoring jobs that trigger ansible tasks whenever they notice that a brick is down or something and they all do it in different ways yeah. so we have to figure out what is the best way for most users and I'm not sure if we already found a really good yeah, solution for that. This ticks the box of having like you know this limited list of policies mm -hmm. you might select from right? Yeah. Use it class A and user class B and so on goes by different policies. Yes. I was just afraid because uh, if this is commodity hardware mm -hmm. underneath, <coughs> and you only have these two replicas, or, mm -hmm. you know, one and the other break, um, you are not resilient anymore. Mm -hmm. if one disappears, <coughs> yeah, 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 transient yeah. failures, yeah. you know, all yeah. the classics. And basically, the other commodity hardware just happens to decide I'm going out of business yeah. as well, right? It's yeah. cheap hardware. Yeah, no, exactly. Uh, yeah. So, so with, with cheap hardware, what we tend to use for Gluster, mm -hmm. um, if you have one or half of your hardware failing, a lot of users buy hardware from a set of batch or a whole batch. So they get the whole series of, I don't know, um, a particular server line. And um, those often contain, for example, the same disks. Right. So if one server fails, it is very likely that the other server fails shortly after. Right. <laughs> um, if you have only one copy of your data, that's a really dangerous scenario. So we suggest that you use um, either three copies, depending on how you set your portfolio, or um, in general, we advise you to use uh, a RAID environment below the bricks, so we don't use single disks, we suggest to use RAID unless you do 
uh, more fancy erasure coding kind of things. Um, so at least you have some resilience there. Yeah. So you actually um, recommend like uh, LVM rate? Um, we, we recommend we recommend a hardware rates. Okay. Um, so mo most users tend to put 12 disks in a RAID set and use this RAID set as a brick. So that an actual disk failure, either with uh, RAID 6 or with RAID 1.0, um, isn't too difficult to repair and they have someone running through the data center checking the little lights and replacing disks. So um, that, that's what a lot of users tend to use, but it costs a lot of storage, you need a lot of disks, so we also have a feature called erasure coding, um, and that actually splits up da data or the files into um, chunks, these chunks get encoded, and um, if you have a chunk missing on a disk, so you don't use rate below that, but um, use the disks directly, you still would use LVM below, but um, you put these chunks on the disk, if the disk fails, this chunk is missing, but you can actually repair the data, the whole, whole file, with some of these missing chunks. So that's, that's an option if you want to be more space efficient, you can use erasure coding. It costs more CPU to calculate all this, but um, it's more efficient, and especially for archiving use cases and um, inactive data, so write once and read many times, or write rarely, read many times. Those are very good candidates for, for example, um, the erasure coded volumes. Um, so the normal replicated volumes are similar to RAID 1. You can have two replicas, you can have more replicas if you want to, but it costs physical disks in the end, each copy that you have. One more question regarding that: uh, If the disk is failing, do you know how it behaves? Um, so the question is: If, if I don't use RAID, yeah, hard drives below, and the disk is starting to fail, mm -hmm. it's not what, what to monitor it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah so but uh, well, so if it, it starts failing, then I will get these read errors from yeah. from drive, yeah. and yeah. how the will the cluster help handle that? So the, the, the first no will answer to that call, so the file will be taken from the other server. <laughs> yeah, so um, how do you detect disk failures is the question, if you have a single disk. It's not really right? detect uh, how it will behave if my disk will start failing. Yes, so, well, if, if you have if, a... If it, if it will still run and uh, just uh, from all to time. Read, read everything from the second disk if I get <laughs> EO errors on the first one? So, um, Yes, yeah, so if you get certain errors on your disk, um, we, we, so the file system most likely will become read-only. Mm -hmm. Yeah? Okay. Uh, so that's what the kernel would do if it really gets disk errors. Um, in that case, we notice that something really weird happened, and we stop this particular brick process for okay. this particular disk. Um, yeah, so okay. it is very clear which content is still valid. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. The, back to the translators, you will see them later on in, in the volume file if, if you have the laptop with you and <coughs> everything. Um, the translators are so really flexible, so we've had the distribution logic, we have the replication logic, you can combine these two. So you can create a distributed replicated volume, which means that you create on the bottom stack two replicated volumes, so volume number zero has two servers and two bricks, volume number one has two servers and two bricks. These two act like something like a subvolume, and this is another subvolume. The distribution logic can use subvolumes, and it says, okay, well, we have two replicas, but the distribution logic really doesn't care what's below it. So it says, okay, we distribute this particular file to subvolume number zero and this particular file to subvolume number one. So in the end, it's pretty simple, 
especially if you understand how distribution logic works and how the replication logic works, you can just stack them on top of each other and um, all the calls get passed on, the data gets passed on, and the client just says, okay, this is a distribution logic, so I need to write to this particular subvolume. The client also does the replication, so it says, we have to write this particular file to these two bricks. Yeah. Uh, you asked if it would be possible to have a scenario where you have a replicated volume, high speed link, and all that, and the, let's say, slower one that would be uh, uh, over one link, copy, let's say, like the equivalent of ZFSN, something like that. Is uh, this a supported scenario? Uh, so I don't know how ZFS would do that. Um, but, well, it's, support, it's open source, right? Supported is relative. But um, what well, you. Is yeah. Um, so, it would work just fine, but a write needs acknowledgement from both sides. So, a read will always be served from the fastest. So, most of the times it's the local environment that you have, but a write needs to be acknowledged to both sides, and um, that will hit performance. It's also file creation, or, um, for example, the, the checks that are getting done when you open a file. They need acknowledgement from both sides to see, okay, are the files in sync? So the open call, which or the stat call, actually, um, that does check for inconsistencies. And if you have a remote site, then normally that gets um, delayed. Does uh, expects all the nodes to be in sync all the time? And uh, I was trying to cheat let's say, by uh, you know, disconnecting the node and let, let it catch up with the other nodes. So make it asynchronously, uh, but not how it does yeah. yeah. so, the So the replication logic um, is really synchronous. Um, we do have a way of doing asynchron replication, um, which where you can put your replicated environment on a different part of the world and it will do geo-replication, we call it. Um, so that's, that's one of the options you would have. You, there are users that say, well, performance is not the most important part for us, and we want this synchronous replication, um, but we want it spread over multiple data centers. Some users do it, but um, you have to take into account that performance most likely will suffer. Um, if you have a disconnect between those data centers, performance will suffer even more until the disconnects are really noticed, and yeah, that that's so. It depends on on your needs and what performance you accept. Um, all of this, we have different ways of, of mounting. So the client is over Fuse. We have an NFS server that we ship with Cluster. NFS version three is um, provided with that. NFS Kinesia is a fully featured NFS server. Samba is an option, so there's a native module for Samba um, that uses libgf API and speaks, therefore, the native cluster protocols. Um, Swift and Pilot mentioned earlier, and uh, KMU, Beros, and other projects use libgf API or tie in with cluster on, on other ways. We provide packages for many different distributions. Um, it's part of Fedora, it's part of Debian, it's part of NetBSD. The CentOS storage SIG provides packages for uh, Gluster 3.6, Gluster 3.7, for both CentOS 7 and CentOS 6. <coughs> Some other random distributions are available from download.cluster.org. We have a group of maintainers that tries to push packages for different distributions, but most of the packages are maintained uh, well. I guess all of the packages are maintained by volunteers from the cluster community. Um, so packages for certain distributions tend to um, take a bit more time to get produced and pushed at, available uh, than others. We have different quick start guides as well. So now um, this is where you should get active. So I hope you have a VM prepared. Uh, I like to use CentOS. For my testing, it's a little bit more stable than Fedora does. Fedora changes on occasion, and I would have to adapt my, my scripts. 
CentOS makes it a bit easier to run. So um, what you would do, you would install the LustreFS server package. And um, that's basically it. So you, on CentOS, you enable it with systemctl. On, um, or on CentOS 7, you do it with systemctl. On CentOS 6, you would use uh, the servers script and check config. And you start. That's, this is basically how you start up your first trusted storage pool. <coughs> So I can give you, I'm not sure who's trying this out now, um, who, who needs to see the commands, because I can show you, maybe, if we have a little bit of network. Um, <laughs> it's a very little bit. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So um, we, we almost got USB sticks with, with everything on it, um, but unfortunately that didn't work out. So um, people have to use it on their own system. So this can, is. Can you pass sticks around with just the packages on? <laughs> um, if we have a USB stick, we could. Yes. Um, but there's CentOS packages, right? I have CentOS packages. Yes. Okay. Um, but okay. Yes. Yeah, so during the previous. Talk. I already got some of the the bits. Um, at least, I hope. Um, well, let's see. So, what you would do on on CentOS six or CentOS seven? That's an additional step to Fedora. Uh, <coughs> so, what you get is a. On CentOS, you get a um, YUM repo file. And it's a very small thing, so it works pretty well. So this, this creates a file. Uh, so this is the file, and it contains the YUM repository details and everything. Um, for Fedora and many other distributions, the packages are just available in the standard repositories. Okay, so you install the Treffes server, pull in all the dependencies it needs. Um, we sign it with the central storage SIG <coughs> key in this case. Um, yeah. And actually you need to do it on two servers. So going back to the slides, it's installing um, systemctl enable plus the D, plus the D is the management daemon, systemctl start plus the D, and after that you can peer probe. So So just to be sure, make sure that 
Gloucester D is running. Um, So after peer probing, you can check which systems are available and um, localhost and the remote system. So these are the, the commands in case anyone still needs them. What, what cluster uh, is using this peer probe? Sorry? What uh, cluster is using this uh, peer probe? Standard uh, application? If you run volume is this peer that you report? So, so the Gluster peer probe command um, connects to other Gluster D servers and it exchanges version information and, and other bits um, and members of the, of the environment and everything. So um, after peer probing, a Gluster server is part of the trusted storage pool. No. Yes, you need to peer probe a server before. So peer probing really says, okay, now we're together in a cluster environment, and only after that we can actually um, use the services on that server. Right. So that's the peer probing. So now you created your trusted storage pool. The next step is to create a brick. Creating a brick. I said is a brick basically is a mounted file system somewhere. Um, so yeah, you, you have to create a brick and um, Yeah, Could thank you. Could have done that in one go, by the way, which is saying VG create, VG name, and reference the list of physical volumes you want. Presumably that's spare ones, right? Um, yeah, so that really depends on your environment. So uh, a lot of users tend to create um, yeah, everything on demand. So you don't really know in advance, or you don't really add bricks in advance or prepare logical volumes right. in advance. I'm just pointing out that mm. uh, you don't need two commands to actually get the volume group being created. Okay. That's, that's my only point. Okay, that's good. So um, I don't remember how big my second disk case, but um, PGs will tell you. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, I'll, I'll just create a 512 megabyte disk uh, or volume group. Create an XFS file system. And um, I'll create a devconf underscore zero directory to mount it. I'll also add it to ETCFS tab so that it automatically gets mounted on boot. Um, so that's basically the preparation of a brick, which is the first set, point number four. Obviously, you have to do all these things on multiple servers. Um, 
normally you would use different tools to do this. Um, some people prefer like SSH, uh, cluster SSH. Um, I mostly put them in a script and run that script or use Ansible to, to do all this. But instead of adding all of these additional tools to a presentation, um, I prefer to make it really simple and very clear what you're doing, that you can do a lot of automation around it. That <coughs> should be really obvious. And hopefully um, everyone or everyone would, would do this. Um, But yes, you can automate everything you, you like um, on your own way, and I'm not going to prescribe or suggest to use Ansible or something else. Um, that's really completely up to you, and I don't want to confuse anyone that's not using Puppet for whatever reason. Um, okay, so we created these bricks. So the cluster volume create command has different options. Um, we just create a, a simple, it doesn't even matter. Um, would you like to see a replica volume or rather a distributed volume? Distributed. Distributed, okay. Um, <laughs> yeah, so um, So I like to add another directory behind the actual brick name so that um, when the server boots um, and mounting would fail for whatever particular reason um, or you create something wrong with a lot of users that fat finger things. Um, I, add, I like to add another directory, a subdirectory into the, into the brick to make sure that everything's there when we need it. Um, not everyone might be aware that you can do interesting shell expansions, like the um, two host names I put there between brackets. It actually expands to this whole command. So if you have multiple servers, you can make it a bit shorter the command that you're executing. Okay, so we created the volume. And um, this is how the volume looks like. It says created, it says the bricks. The next, start, next step is to start the volume. And the only difference is that it says started. The people on the, who are executing this on the laptops can see that many processes have been started now. So, um, Different processes are now running, and, well, um, I'm not going to explain what they do. Some of them provide configuration <coughs> files, log files, um, well, the different port numbers that are used, and you can uh, see a lot of it. Um, so, there's a volume status command that says, okay, we have the NFS server um, not running. We didn't start RPC bind, so the, RPC, the NFS server failed to start. But that's just a minor thing that's in the old packages that are currently in the CentOS storage check, and the next update will be in a couple of days that fixes it. Um, <coughs> the bricks, each brick is its own user space process. Each brick listens on its own port. So, the brick on this server, this is on this port, the same port is used but on different servers. So you have to read the whole line to make sense out of it. Um, process IDs are listed as well, so in case something is not working as you think it should work, um, you can check the process ID, you can see if the process ID is stuck um, on the kernel or whatever things. Um, so you can do 
you can do um, helpful things like um, oh. there is for example stack <coughs> if, if the process is completely blocked you can see what's, what's happening there and um, for the people debugging things that's, that's often very useful um, so this is how we created the volume we started the volume Oh yes, let's see that we can actually use it. It really doesn't matter from what host name you mount. So I mount it from local host, because the D runs on this particular storage server, but I could pick any of the servers that they would like to. And the first line says, OK, we mounted localhost on um, such MNT. And um, it's there. The traffic will not go over localhost. It will resolve the host name. So on mounting, the localhost service returns the volume layout. The volume layout contains the host names and the break ports and everything that it needs to know. So the Fuse client, in this case, connects to the servers by hostname, resolves the hostname, connects to the port, and then actually goes and do the I.O. You create a file, slash mnt readme. The file is just there, it's just a normal file system, it's not anything funky, object access kind of protocols. You can do anything with the file that you could normal, on a normal file system. Um, I mentioned that the bricks contain the data. We have a distributed file system. This server doesn't have the readme file. It's distributed. Obviously, it is distributed to the other server. Well, hopefully. If it's not there, then um, <laughs> you probably should all just walk out. And <laughs> yeah, so... <laughs> um, no, so um, it's distributed over two servers. The readme file is only on one server and not on the other. So it's expected uh, user IDs, loop IDs, and so on are yes. synchronized between the servers. It doesn't really need that. Um, it needs to be synchronized between all of the clients. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, yes, well, for, for permission checking, it also needs to be the group IDs and everything need to be on the server side. Yeah. Uh, well, it, no, it doesn't need to be on the server side because we just store it on the server and the server doesn't really care what username is attached to a group. We, we transfer them one on one on the server side, so the server doesn't really care about usernames or anything. Mm -hmm. um, what's, what's the use case behind like this cross switch type of distribution? If I understand it right, you mm -hmm. know, uh, server A creates updates, writes file, and it lives on break number two on, mm -hmm. on server two and vice versa, right? Yeah. So, of course, um, if the writing machine dies, it's still accessible on the other one, but what's the so, hard use case here? So, well, um, it depends, uh, it depends <coughs> really on your workload. So, in general, there's no need to mount on the cluster servers themselves. You would have a storage environment and you would have clients. So there you don't have this distinction. Yeah. In this case, there's no locality of, well, there is locality of data, but not on the create path. There is locality of data in the read path, because the storage server that has the data <laughs> would reply fastest right. if you open a file. So we have, um, for example, extensions to Hadoop. Hadoop as a MapReduce big data kind of tool. Um, what Hadoop does is it moves the actual procedures or the actual functionality, the function, the calculations, the data reading, the data calculations, whatever it does, it moves it to the servers that have the data. So that the data does not need to get transported over the network continuously. Which is much more efficient if you have big data then um, <coughs> it would make sense to transfer all this big data over the network so you want to have your big data 
framework move these particular jobs, this functionality to the servers that have this data and um, execute it locally on those systems. So writing the data in Gluster is not local. You can figure out which servers, so we have special extended attributes that the Hadoop plugin uses. It asks, okay, um, this particular extended attribute on a file and that result in the extended attribute describes which servers contain the data and then the Hadoop scheduler knows, okay, we are going to move this particular piece of the job to these servers that have the data and the data is local um, to the actual processing. Um, okay, so this is how we use it. Um, the so I was going to say, okay, um, you can now check, for example, um, details about um, the volume. So I explained about the um, <coughs> about the translators. Uh, let's go. So this is the translator stack um, that gets sent to the client process. So the client process has a translator called debug IO stats. It has a translator called performance MD cache, so the metadata cache. It has another translator performance open behind. Um, quick read, IO cache. We have a lot of translators that are listed on the client side. And most interesting for now is the distribution logic. So DHT is our distribute hashing translator um, called Gluster Distribute. And I mentioned before, it uses bricks or subvolumes, which are basically the same. It doesn't really matter what's that. So we call them subvolumes internally. And um, the DHT, because it's client side, needs to communicate with servers. It has two subvolumes, that front client zero and that front client one. These subvolumes are listed just above it. The order doesn't really matter um, because they reference each other always. So all of these mention, for example, the subvolume, except for the protocol client. The protocol client doesn't mention the subvolume. The protocol client says this brick is located on this remote host, and this is the actual path for the brick. So. Um, we, act, we actually ask, the, the ports of the brick are more or less dynamic, and we actually ask these, this server in this case, which port is this brick running on? And then the management team replies, okay, this particular brick is running on this particular port. Distribution uses, in this case, two servers or two bricks. The brick processes use, use a different translator, um, stack and these are two distinct processes running on two distinct servers. So if we for example take um, so we have this particular um, Subvolume, this was the directory, and it's running on this server, so it's the other window. <laughs> we see that um, there is this ID, hostname, um, path of the brick, and the path, <laughs> are the path, the slashes are replaced with, with dots. Um, of the dots with, uh, with dashes. So um, that's basically how Gluster sets up all of these, these details. Um, you have log files for, for everything. Um, so 
this is the log file, and the log file also contains, so we have one binary. This binary receives the volume file, the volume file which contains the layout or the, the stack of translators for this particular process. So one binary, doesn't matter if it's um, a brick process or a client process, this binary loads all of these translators in this particular order. And um, brick process just get a different stack of translators than that clients do. So, um, on top of the brick process is um, the POSIX translator, which speaks file system protocol. Open calls, write calls, read calls, everything. We have different translators on the bricks, and um, so each functionality is basically its own translator. The top translator of the brick process is the network I.O. It's the protocol server translator, which actually receives the client protocol um, data over the network, and um, that's how they talk to each other. So there are different options and different things you can pass along. Yeah. Uh, the communication between the nodes, uh, it's unencrypted, un un or what's the authentication of um, the nodes? So, yes, so um, there, we don't do encryption by default. If you want, you can configure it to use SSL encryption. Um, we are planning to support Kerberos encryption and um, full Kerberos support. Sim very si so the protocol is very similar to NFS. So it's um, so you adopting Kerberos is, is one of the things that is um, a pretty natural evolvement of our protocol. So SSL is not user dedicated. It's it's client side initiated. So any users using this SSL encryption, um, they use the same. Details, it's, it's all hidden for the users, but um, in the end, it's the, the user data that it gets encrypted exactly the same way as another user, which is not always what you want. Um, sometimes you have multiple users, and, and they, don't, they really are not allowed to read the same data, even if they are able to capture the network traffic or some of the other. So we need a per-user encryption mechanism, and Kerberos <coughs> would, would offer that. Um, also, SSL isn't always the easiest to maintain. A lot of companies already have Kerberos infrastructure available, and um, if we can use that same infrastructure, that would be beneficial for, for us, but also for um, a lot of com companies. Uh, it's always strange, but how does it cope with uh, applications which write data and post the data in the sense that the uh, you know, snapshotting can alter the consistency of the files. So well, there are servers transactional which generally write each file as a database. Mm -hmm. So trying to do a snapshot with a bit less storage that can cause data loss. How is Gluster coping with this? Um, I'm not sure if I understood, but Gluster offers a snapshot capability. Well, Yes, and this usually is browser applications which are not really well working with this. Mm -hmm. uh, how Gluster deals with this? It does so block level, when it comes to replication, for example, does block level copy of the data or...? Uh, so the replication is, is <coughs> client side and it's per file. But if you, do if you want to do snapshots, we use um, thin provisioned LVMs in the backend to do, to do snapshots. And we orchestrate the snapshotting of all of the bricks um, through the cluster command line. So I would base, I would think that if your application can use or works on LVM snapshots, it should work with cluster on LVM snapshots. If it does not, um, except for so obviously cluster adds a bit more delay doing that because it's over the network and doing orchestration between a lot of things. But um, your application should just work with that. Um, the applications that write something like that, um, yeah, uh, so they, they, there's FS freeze and, and tools like that that um, should prevent those inconsistencies. So 
um, yeah, if, if you have any inconsistencies with that and you have a very clear example of how you can get to these inconsistencies, we surely would like to know and we would like to see how we can add this and fix that. So, yeah. Yes. But that's what that's why we add this in our cluster tools. So cluster takes care of doing that for you. It's surely not easy to do. Okay. That's true. No. But um, that's that's <coughs> why we have developers working on those things. We will have it. Sorry. We will have it. It's already available. Yeah. It's so it's even user serviceable. Um, so. I'm not really sure how we're doing on time. Uh, 10 minutes. Okay. Or 30 minutes, actually. 13. 30? Yeah. Okay. 13 minutes. Hmm? 13. 13. Okay. <laughs> yeah, so. Um, uh, I can explain you a little bit more about um, the schedule, but I don't. If you really want to know, you can ask me later. That's, that's not of the most important things. Um, so we have three, di three different stable releases at the moment. 3.5 introduced several features already. Um, for example, this big failure detection, what you mentioned earlier, what happens. Um, earlier versions tend to hang or not or get non-responsive, um, but the process would still be there, and that confused clients, so um, we fixed that. Um, Improved SSL support, SSL was really difficult to work with. It's available for a while already, but it's really difficult to configure correctly. We improved this a bit. Um, snapshots was introduced in 3.6. Um, monitoring got improved with the cluster wide logs. Erasure coding got added as a volume creation option. 3.7 added yet another few features and even more than we did in the releases before that. Um, yeah, so tearing hot and cold contents is one of the hot features that, that people really would like to see. Um, Windows users and maybe Mac users are used to deleting a file and figuring out where the file is after they deleted it because they actually didn't want to delete it, so we have a trash option. Um, actually, the Linux people seem to know what they're doing, so all these requests come in through some of folks and, and uh, macOS users. Um, Bitrot is a very interesting feature. So we need to be able to detect if data gets rotten or if, for example, this um, disks get bigger and bigger every time. Um, if you have per gigabyte uh, one in a million bits that reads on failure or on how many disks, I don't know. Um, if you have bigger disks, that failure quote, <coughs> um, one failure per, per million disks or whatever, stay, or per megabyte stays the same. But if you have bigger disks, you get more megabytes on a disk. And um, the failure percentage of read errors or silent errors on a disk increases. So we need a way to figure out um, how to detect this earlier and better. Bitrot is one of these things that can do that. You sign the data that gets written, and periodically or on read, you actually check if the signature is still correct. So not all disk failures get propagated to all of the layers in the kernel or the, fi on the file system or anywhere. Some of those errors are bit flips. They can be in the cables. It doesn't have to be the disk itself. Um, it can be in the firmware. It can be practically anywhere in the stack. Um, but we need to detect that um, as best as we can. And a bit of this one of the ways to do that. Uh, do you have any plans for use of uh, butter for so? It would significantly help with big um, problems and such a snapshot. So some people have an interest there. Um, and um, some, well, actually, Facebook is one of our uh, biggest users. Mm -hmm. And they have clusters running, I think, on ext4. But they have shadow clusters running on ButterFS. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's how the ButterFS developers test their file system. Um, <laughs> Gluster seems to be very well uh, exercising lots of ButterFS um, corner cases. So um, yeah, ButterFS is one of the options. If you want to use ButterFS 
um, instead of the list <coughs> provided bitrot, you already can. Um, you can use Gluster as bitrot on Butterfs as well. But in the end, you probably want to be able to check for failures on every layer. Yeah, definitely. So, yes, so I don't know if what kind of interface Butterfs offers to application using Butterfs to detect these errors. But yeah, you, you want to detect errors on the low level and have those error messages propagated up to the stack. and. Each layer in the stack, so hardware disk, from uh, um, ca uh, cables if possible, um, chipsets. Then somewhere the kernel driver comes in. Every layer would need to propagate um, error detection so that you can actually follow up where an error happens and you can say, okay, this particular piece of hardware is broken or this particular piece in the file system is broken or actually this is a user space error or anything like that. So, um, I'm not aware of any current plans, but um, yeah, it, it surely is something we want to think about, but one file system is maybe not sufficient yet um, to actually use it. So currently we advise XFS because XFS is extremely well tested and proven to work very well for large disks. Um, so that's, that's where we are now. Okay. Yeah. Just to understand right, uh, you're thinking about uh, doing bit drop detection all the way up your local server stack into <coughs> the daemon, basically. The right. Daemon. And, you know, transport type bit drop uh, and all the rest of it is out of the picture in terms of this initial... In, in terms design. of this, yes, yeah. yes, mm -hmm. yes. So, um, we currently use bit drop detection that is only our process. So we sign the data, we store the data in extended attribute and verify if this is all correct. Yeah. Um, anything below that, I don't know if, for example, LVM would be able to provide us um, with an API that says, okay, actually we wrote something to disk at one point, but now we're reading something else or we have particular errors um, that are not necessarily disk initiated or disk errors, but some other way of errors. Yeah, we do have DM Verity, which provides that kind of action. Like mm -hmm. This is the content I put on, okay. and it's still valid, yeah. right? but I'm not sure if that will help you essentially. Well, so, um, Fenki and you should talk together. Fenki is the main developer for Bitrot. Mm -hmm. um, so you <laughs> develop Bitrot, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Give me a data, sorry. Give me a data. <laughs> So um, one of the heavy features is tiering that we added. Um, I was planning to show that a little bit, but um, we don't have that much time left. If someone wants to see it, I can show you afterwards. Um, if you have your existing volume, what you do is you create another um, brick, basically, possibly on the SSD, um, and you attach this brick to your volume. You can do replication and other things we stuff with that as well. Sharding, splitting up files in multiple pieces is very useful for big, uh, big files, mainly VM images. Um, yeah. Yeah, it's an SSD. Uh, isn't it uh, that the client is the um, problem here with performance? Because I think that uh, the main um, main problem is on time where you load the performance there. because you can scale um, out with the whole cluster class, yes, class, cluster and basically when you have like thousands of, of nodes mm -hmm. you have the problem on the, on the client on this uh, single network point. Uh, no, so the clients talk to all of those yeah. servers, right? So, so they get distributed, so it's not a really a single point of network. Um, but if you have many clients, you definitely want your storage to be fast enough. Is the, is the slower point of the whole cluster? The client? Yeah, the yeah. client interface, network interface. Yes, um, but for example, clients have or tend to have um, maybe 100 megabytes or maybe a gigabit network mm -hmm. connections. Servers tend to be connected to switches that have at least 10 gigabit or mm -hmm. maybe even InfiniBand or uh, multiple 10 gigabit connections. Mm -hmm. So they can address many more clients, and all of those clients together surely oh. are able to... <laughs> okay. Yeah. Yeah. Um, 
OK, so sharding and splitting of files, and we improved the virtual machine workloads for that really a lot. So one single virtual machine actually addresses multiple servers because they, the shards, the bits, of the, the pieces of the virtual machine image get distributed over many servers. So one hypervisor actively talks to many servers for one virtual machine for its storage. And it also helps a lot of recovery time and other things because we're using smaller files um, without you need to recover a huge big file at once. Enabling it is as simple as um, enabling the feature. And um, by default, it's four megabyte shards. For virtual machines, I think 512 was one of the um, sweet spots where people tested it. NFS Kinesia support um, has improved. So um, we integrate with NFS Kinesia natively. We want to um, make NFS Kinesia the default NFS server because it's a full featured NFS server instead of cluster NFS, which only has NFS version 3. It's also pretty simple to set up. Um, 3.8 gets released hopefully in May, June timeframe. Um, Tiering gets more flexible. It's one of the highlights. Um, there was a talk about Hecate yesterday, which manages Gluster and makes it more automation. So um, actually, so automating the failure of bricks <coughs> is made possible with, with Hecate, I think. Um, we support Seek Data, Seek Hole, which is a virtual machine use case. So we'll send patches to KMU to actually use it, um, and some more plans. Uh, yeah? Right, the opposite of the sharding problem, maybe uh, there's uh, something that's in the wish list for uh, cluster, the handling of cache of a lot of small files. Uh, there's a lot of metadata traffic that mm -hmm. will also heavily, uh, my use case was build servers. Mm -hmm. So Jenkins puts from Git, starts a Git, GCC and creates thousands and thousands yeah. of files and that had a huge performance yeah. impact at the time and then it's in the wish list. So is that... Uh, is that a valid use case for cluster? Or are we asking it to do something that's not supposed it de to? It depends on what you need for performance, right? So you can do your built environments on cluster, but performance will not be very good because um, cluster, so each file that you open or each file that you execute the stat system call does it check if the file contents is in sync on others. And that's a huge overhead. So for built environments, Doing that on cluster, it should just work fine. It's just not fast. We are working on improving it. Um, so with, with our DHT version 2, we are going to improve that really a lot, hopefully. Uh, I don't know yeah. how much. But are you yeah. using Fuse or NFS? Oh. Uh, Fuse, NFS was even worse, so Fuse does behave mm. a lot better, and also it yeah. enabled the lookup on hashed auto mm. option, mm. so that helps, but I don't it's safe, so that's a completely different question. Yeah, so, it, so, so doing a built environment on cluster is normally not very smart. The, um, the, con the result of your build, you should probably put on cluster. Okay. Um, if you have any other questions, um, at least Fenki and I, and maybe some of the other cluster developers will be around the room um, to answer them. You can also happily send emails to our list. Um, we are on Freenode on IRC, and any questions can be answered there. So. Yeah, okay. Well, thanks for joining. Okay, yeah. But uh, because it's like, if you have a bit of time, I can show you my, my issue. Um, yeah, just copy the slides to... You want the PDF or the ODP? Both? Uh, probably PDF should be fine. I can do both. Uh, I think should be On Sunday? Yeah. Thank <laughs> you.
Thanks for mentioning this. Oh, I always try to. <laughs> So I am waving. You're Vlad, right? Pashik. So I'm going to get you and Adam, KB, Brian, uh, no, I'm going and a few people from our team to start a mailing yeah, list sure. of OpenShift Linux OS. I think that it'll